Max Payne 3 was a project headed up by a completely different developer than the prior titles, intended as the end to a franchise that they had no intimate experience with. The game ran on a new engine with mechanics that operated nearly the exact opposite as they had in previous titles. There were a myriad of issues throughout development, such as the lack of a voice actor for the main character incredibly late into production, and the constant delays for release. On top of all of this, the marketing materials depicted the game in a way that made fans angry at best, opting to exclusively show the drastic changes made to the setting and main character, which were truly only a fraction of the whole experience. Despite the disaster of a finished product that this opening may imply, upon release, Max Payne 3 quickly turned from the sequel nobody wanted into the game everyone wanted a sequel to. In the first two Max Payne games, players would aim the cursor in the general direction of enemies, enter bullet time, and fire until they stopped moving. The weapons were inaccurate, and while that may be a knock against some other games, they were intentionally designed this way. In Max Payne 1 and 2, the inaccurate weapons work in favor of fulfilling the player's power fantasy, allowing them to focus on pulling off the coolest moves possible without needing to worry about hitting every single shot. Max Payne 3 does the exact opposite, instead forcing players to engage with the further expanded bullet time mechanics and be pixel precise with their shots. While in bullet time, players' shots will go exactly where the cursor is pointed, every single time. This means that if you miss a shot, it truly and honestly was your own fault, lending to the increased difficulty of this entry in the series when compared to the prior titles. Max also has a greater sense of physicality within the world. In the first two games, Max could dive into the level geometry and it would allow the player to continue shooting in slow motion. However, in Max Payne 3, bumping into any object can decrease or fully stop Max's momentum, even going so far as to take him out of bullet time. Additionally, Max will stay on the ground in whatever position he landed in until there is input from the player wherein Max will then struggle up onto his feet and continue fighting. Even something as simple as his animation to get off the ground, illustrating that he is clearly not the same young and mobile Max we are used to controlling, is enough to add weight to the gameplay. This increased focus on the bullet time mechanics ensures that the few times in which that ability is taken away from the player stand out even more than they would have otherwise. For example, in Chapter 6, after the building begins to crumble, Max is only able to limp around and he can't shoot dodge for the rest of the level. While this may not affect gameplay all that much on the lower difficulty levels, it presented an incredibly tense challenge when playing on hard mode, where the shoot dodge move is an essential part of your arsenal. This spike in difficulty for the franchise may result in players dying and restarting a lot more often than they used to, but that's alright because Rockstar included numerous voice lines for all characters, Max included, that will trigger at random for each checkpoint that you reload. This means that you may be stuck on a really difficult part of a level, but you still get to experience something new each time, even if it is just another line of Max's narration. Rockstar successfully took the tried and tested Max Payne gameplay formula, one that had been quite effective up until that point, and created something with it so addicting that it is even difficult for me to go back to the first two games so close to playing this one. They figured out what worked and amplified it to the point of perfection. In my video titled The GTA 6 Trailer, I discuss how the majority of Rockstar titles use themes of betrayal and revenge as a storytelling crutch, one which they rely on far too often for it to remain an effective technique. I even mentioned Max Payne 3 during that portion of the video, although briefly. I didn't analyze Max Payne 3's story in depth during that video for two main reasons. The first being that I wanted to make a video solely dedicated to Max Payne 3. And second, I think Max Payne 3's story utilizes the themes of betrayal and revenge in a wholly different manner, separate from the rest of Rockstar's catalog. Where other Rockstar games use betrayal as the big twist in their story, treating it as some sort of surprise that is supposed to hold significance and have an emotional impact on the player, all while doing the polar opposite, 
Max Payne 3 uses that notion to its advantage. Throughout the game, there are telltale signs that certain members of the Bronco family, and even your partner, Raul Passos, are betraying Max and setting him up to take the fall at every turn. For example, during Chapter 6, players can find emails and a folder containing information about Fabiana's personal schedule in Victor's office. Just before the attack on the office building commences, Passos, Marcelo, Victor, and even the chief of police all head off in a helicopter together, specifically leaving Max and Rodrigo behind. In addition to that, at the start of Chapter 7, Max calls Victor and Marcelo to tell them that he's alive and that he's going to get Fabiana back from her kidnappers. Rather than explain what happens, I just want you to watch how this plays out. Hello. Hello, Victor. Max? Max, you're, you're, you're alive? Of course I'm alive. We did not know this. We are lost, Max. Our brother was everything to us. I understand. Listen, I'm, I'm sorry about your loss. Both of you. Rodrigo was a good man. I failed him. I, but I was tricked. What happened, Max? I don't know. Some guys from the crush of Prado came into the building downstairs, so while me and the security guard were dealing with them, an assassin must have come in and executed your brother. I, at least that's how I think it happened. Man, you killed him, Poha. You killed my brother. What are you talking about? I, I understand you're upset, but please, why the hell would I do that? To get his money, to take his money. How am I getting his money, Marcelo? Please, think. I work my ass off for your family. I saved your life twice, or more. And right now, I'm going to get Fabiana. Where is she? Where is Fabiana, eh? She's in a place called Nova Esperanza. How do you know this, Max? One of the crotch of Prado told me just before he died. Please, bring our sister-in-law back to us, Max. Our family is being torn apart. Everything about this scene. The way Victor and Marcelo are behaving prior to Max's call, their reaction to Max being alive, the way Marcelo tries to haphazardly pin Rodrigo's death on Max, even down to the lighting and camera angles, all scream to the player that Victor and Marcelo, as well as Passos, are betraying Max and planning to use him as their scapegoat for everything that's happened thus far. Max Payne 3 deliberately exaggerates these story beats of the Broncos betraying Max and his revenge on them for doing so, almost to the point of absurdity, spelling it out in bright neon lights where it is nigh impossible for players, even on their first run through the campaign, not to realize what is happening. So why do I like this game's use of these narrative tropes while despising it when they're in other Rockstar titles? Because other Rockstar titles make betrayal the main story twist and expects players to take it seriously. While in Max Payne 3, the Bronco family betraying Max isn't the main twist at all. If you were a longtime Max Payne fan at the time the third game released, you almost positively went into the game expecting for it to end only one way, with Max's death. Surely there's only so far he could be pushed before either giving up or die trying, right? Well, Max doesn't die. In fact, he even saves someone, for what probably feels like the first time in forever for him, and stops some awful people along the way. Max has spent years feeling trapped in a loop where he keeps getting the women in his life killed, all starting back with his wife and daughter when they were murdered in their home, and he was powerless to stop it. At countless points throughout the series, and especially in this entry, Max makes it clear to the player through his internal monologue that he desperately wants to break this trend, and if he could protect even just one girl, maybe it would give him the closure he craves regarding the death of his family. And towards the end of the game, we finally see him do just that, by saving Giovanna, Fabiana's younger sister. Max wins, and he finally gets what he spent years searching for at the bottom of a bottle. In the final scene of the game, we see him at a bar, but this time he's not slumped over wallowing in self-pity. 
He's as sober as he's going to get, and he's watching the television where a reporter recounts the events that transpired in the final level at the airport, as well as showing the fate of Victor Bronco, who was finally brought to justice and will face the law as a result of Max's restraint in not killing him. Max finally gets to end his story not as the one causing the chaos, but simply as a viewer. He is removed from the carnage on screen and is free to walk away and do with his own life as he pleases. Like the reporter on the television says, it's dark in some places, but it is sunny everywhere else. Max is at peace with himself. And that is the twist. One other point I would like to discuss is the culmination of the gameplay and story in Max Payne 3, that being ludonarrative dissonance. Ludonarrative dissonance is the conflict between a video game's narrative told through the story and the narrative told through the gameplay. In the majority of Rockstar's games, players will experience some level of this, especially in the open world titles like Grand Theft Auto or the Red Dead Redemption series. The open-ended nature of their design, allowing players to act on their own accord within the sandbox environment, creates a problem for the storytelling in these games. While players in a campaign mission may be told the severity of their situation and how time-sensitive getting to the next mission is, the cutscene eventually ends, dumping them back into the open world where they can do as they please. They could spend days camping and fishing in Red Dead Redemption 2, all while their next mission is something the main character is supposed to be rushing to reach. Another example of this can be found in GTA 4, where Nico, the main character, is supposedly coming to America to avoid the pitfalls of his previous life, including the turmoil and violence. Yet, the entire game is based around the player engaging in just that, both in the campaign and in the open world. A story sequence in GTA 4 may have Nico discussing how he wants to leave that old life behind, and as soon as it ends, players can pull a small army's worth of weapons out of their back pocket and cause utter chaos in the streets. While this issue is not exclusive to Rockstar titles, it is most definitely prevalent throughout a large portion of their games. Thankfully, there is essentially no ludonarrative dissonance to be found in Max Payne 3 due in large part to the carefully crafted linear experience on offer. What players lose in total freedom over where to go or what to do, they gain back tenfold in a cohesive blend between story and gameplay that is still unrivaled to this day. There was not a single second throughout my numerous playthroughs of this game in which my actions as Max felt out of place within the confines of the story. When you barrel through a room full of enemies, taking them out one by one with perfectly lined up headshots only to be met with even tougher enemies as a result, your reaction, Max's inner monologue, his physical actions, and even the soundtrack all synchronize in a moment that is absolutely exhilarating and is a huge reason as to why I come back to this entry in the series more often than I return to the previous ones. Speaking of the soundtrack, it was created by the band Health, who, up until they began working on this project, had only released two albums and one song for an Australian thriller film. This doesn't exactly sound like a band with the kind of pedigree that you'd want to hire for your big budget AAA video game release, right? Well, not only was Health able to create a soundtrack that gets players blood pumping one minute and is somber and reflective the next, but they were able to directly tie their music into the thematic undertones of the entire game, as well as tie it into Max's own inner conflict. For example, the track Dead uses the sound of a baby crying to symbolize Max's guilt about the death of his family, especially his daughter, and how it is still eating him alive from the inside out. Health further utilized the theme of Max's family in another track, Tears. I'd like to highlight two specific moments in which this song is used. First, there is the iconic airport scene in the final level of the game. Max is pinned down, fighting his way through an evacuated airport as he tries to reach Victor Bronco. He ducks out from behind his cover and begins on nothing short of a rampage through the pristine halls of the airport, gunning down everyone in his way. 
This song kicks in, a remixed version of the one available on the official soundtrack, and you begin your fight. At this point in the game, Max has saved Giovanna, and it's almost as though he feels reinvigorated as a result. Like saving her and gaining the closure he's been searching for has given him the strength he needs to finish this once and for all. Health latches onto this feeling through the lyrics of Tears with lines such as, Trust us now, it's time to let me go, give up on us, follow what you want, give our soul away. All written from the perspective of Max's family, point blank telling him that it is okay to move on, that he's suffered enough. My personal favorite line from this song, the memories are wrong, also directly ties into Max's guilt for the opening moments of the first game. He's spent so many years feeling like he could have been home sooner and saved his family, but the lyric is saying those memories are wrong, that he did everything he could, and that it's okay, even if it wasn't enough. The second moment where this song is used is right at the end of the game as credits start to roll. As previously mentioned, this is the big twist ending, where Max is finally at peace, and when this song cuts in, we know that his battle is over. Not just the one with Victor Bronco, but the one with himself. He has finally let his past go. It's one thing to create a solid soundtrack for a game, but health clearly went above and beyond. They put the effort into not just writing music, but creating art that is so deeply rooted in the themes of the source material that they are practically inseparable from one another. In stark contrast to the rest of Rockstar's titles, Max Payne 3 is a real game. And when I say that, I mean it takes a more grounded, realistic approach to both storytelling and gameplay. I'm not saying any human could survive the number of gunshots that Max sustains over the course of the game simply by taking painkillers and shrugging it off, but Max is significantly more fragile than the player character in most games not just in Rockstar's own catalog. There is a real threat to Max, even if he's only facing down a handful of guys with guns. Not only that, but the game takes the real-world location of Sao Paulo, Brazil, as opposed to a spoof city, such as Liberty City or Los Santos, and the very real problems of human trafficking and organ harvesting, and treats them all as seriously as they should be. There are no light-hearted jokes while walking through a human slaughterhouse, nor are there jokes about Max's struggle with addiction or anything in between. Max Payne 3 treats its own themes, locations, gameplay, and story as a whole with the same maturity, respect, and realism that it deserves. Max Payne 3 should not have been as good as it is, not even close. But the phenomenal story, engaging gameplay, and incredible soundtrack all come together as one cohesive package that is well worth playing even years after release. It is the first game I've played by Rockstar that I've come away with absolutely zero complaints, and it will probably remain that way for a long time. Every single element is given the same level of care as the next, regardless of how small a cog it is in the overall machine, and that's what makes the difference. Max Payne 3 is Rockstar's first real game, and I sincerely hope they make another one like this soon.